Euh, ah, il euh, parle avec oui. nous de <rire> What Happened to Chris, Peter Wright. Et maintenant, voilà. la même question à G de Chris, le artiste. G, What Happened to Chris? I don't know. What happened to Chris? <rire> bon, euh, ici, feel free de Chris. Euh, il parle avec nous euh, de la question uh, What Happened to Chris? Perhaps you could tell us what happened to Crass, feel free. Bonjour. <laughs> I'll be on that. Bye bye, black sheep. You terrible people. What happened to Crass, feel free? You are a member of Crass. Could you tell me what happened to them? We don't seem to hear their music at all. We don't see any of their records, they're not available anywhere, can you tell us what has happened to Crass? This is a perfectly serious question. There's thousands of people throughout the world who are actively involved and interested in Crass, and Crass seem to be doing absolutely nothing whatsoever as an act of responsibility about this. Well, Crass, as a band, have decided that it would be a good idea to s take time to consider what would give the results, what action would give the results we feel is uh, necessary. Yeah, but do you feel any of the actions you've actually made have made have been any sort of valuable contribution? Oh, absolutely. Well, even in the light of sort of present political climate, you really feel that your rantings and ravings over the last seven years have actually contributed something worthwhile? Yes, because I think it's helped to make a great deal of people aware that, in fact, what is happening today is not what they would choose to be happening today. Yeah, but what value is that awareness given that um, the whole world seems to be increasingly becoming right-wing in its thinking? I mean, this awareness doesn't actually seem to have had any practical advantages for anyone. I don't think the whole world is becoming increasingly right-wing. Uh, without getting deeply technical, uh, various economic crises have meant that the inevitable uh, reactions of uh, established order is to become more right-wing. Uh, if a country is in trouble, then it tends to pull itself in and try and control everything that it can, uh, financially, socially, so that the result tends to be a tightening all around. But. It doesn't mean to say that, well, it's, that isn't the best. I mean, that's not actually an answer. So yeah, but I mean, increase the police force because, you know, a country is bankrupt or mm. whatever, or, you know, change laws to, to uh, sort of cut back where cutbacks are being made. But, but, but Crass has made a lot of very self important claims that, you know, that it's helped awareness that it's given out information that otherwise wouldn't have been gained yet I mean I'd still assert that you know nothing of real value seems to have come of this no I don't I nothing it's it would be difficult to say oh you know here is a concrete uh, concrete benefit from what we've done over the last seven years however what I hope we have done, what I feel we have done, is, is to give people an awareness of themselves, which is the only real awareness you can show to people. There's no use telling people how, you know, how to get a better job or how to, how to lead a better life. You can only say to people, is the life you're leading or the life that's been chosen for you the one that you would actually choose? What is it that you really want to do? And what is the best way for you to lead that life which you wish? Um, so whilst, you know, governments may be going one way, a larger percentage or, you know, a reasonably large percentage of the, of a population is, uh, is perhaps going in a different direction. Well, do you, do, you, do you mean by the larger, you know, this, this, these members of the population, are these the sort of rather sad relics of the punk movement that one sees in places like the King's Road and their Mohicans and... By no means, uh... They're, they are the people who will continue a fashion and that'll probably continue for, you know, just as Teddy Boys still exist. 
30 years after rock and roll sort of first hit the headlines. Um, the people that I'm thinking of and I'm talking about and talking to are the people who have, are trying, you know, with their friends or in their own situation to live a life which is to them satisfying, satisfactory, which helps them and will help other people. So these people you don't see sort of loitering on corners with incredible green hairdos. These are the people who are working wherever in their homes, in communities, in uh, in peace centres, bookshops, are actively or passively involved in changing themselves and the world in which they live. And I think, you know, so that you won't see these people. They're not sort of standing on the corner and broadcasting their ideas, but they may well be or, or operating, organising gigs or, uh, you know, projects for communities or groups uh, up and down the country. This is happening all the time. Yeah, but does, I mean, is, is this sort of <coughs> small-scale autonomy? I mean, in, in what way can this really affect sort of long-term policies? I mean, do you see there's any sort of cause to be optimistic in the fact that, okay, so a few people are have organised their own places to have gigs or there's one or two bookshops scattered around the UK, but, I mean, in what way, in the long term, is this going to sort of contribute? Do you feel it can contribute in the long term to a sort of... Yeah, well, I mean, this isn't dramatic and one would like something dramatic. It would be grand if tomorrow we could get up and know that, you know however many thousands or millions of people were prepared to to dramatically, if you like, overthrow the state. But basically, if one's talking about a world of, of self-governing uh, people, then that is what they are. They're people who are getting on with their lives in the way which they choose. Um, certainly, these people that we're talking about are, are now teenagers or in their early 20s. They're going to be living... If you know, on a very basic level, they're going to be living for another 60 years, hopefully, living in a way which they choose, hopefully influencing other people, their children, next generation, whoever, that to uh, to work towards work for their own ends rather than for the great mass, or, you know, for well, what, you know, to follow a set pattern. So I think this situation is good. It, it feels frustrating because always uh, one would like to see something large happen, something dramatic happen. Um, but they do know it isn't going to happen that way. So, I mean, to go back to the original question, then what has happened to Crass within all of this? Crass is still living the life they wish to live. To live still working on ways in which they can best help other people. So, in fact, I think we have been very active over the last year, two years. Some of the records which have come out, uh, Acts of Love, records by other bands, by Hit Parade, by DMV, by Curve, are expressing something more than the simple hardline political socio-political statements they're now about what one does or what one might possibly do had you know if we got beyond the government that we have now if we got beyond the society we have now for the last seven years we to a certain extent and certainly punk has been talking about how to fight the system. What it hasn't been doing is saying, what do we do once we've broken the system? And I think that, if anything, has been the great, uh, the breaking point of punk is that it didn't offer anything beyond the idea that you could smash the system. And what we what we are trying to show people, demonstrate to people, and offer them in the records, the written stuff we do, the, the images that we give, is is that there is possibilities beyond the the system, that there is something to look forward to, that there is something to work for, which is 
beyond the fences which hold us in, beyond the lines of policemen, beyond the government, beyond the nuclear arms. It's if one, you know, if one by getting rid of nuclear arms can only offer people exactly the same world without nuclear arms, the benefits are great, but they're not enough. We have to offer something, something real for people, something which affects them personally, and we have to show people how to find that reality beyond what they have at the moment. Right. Well, uh, at that point, I think we'll uh, swing the uh, microphone over towards G. And uh, thank you, Phil Free, for that explanation of what happened to Crass. Gee, uh, Phil was talking about uh, positive imagery and that sort of thing, and uh, in Acts of Love, which is uh, partly what this interview is about, um, your imagery is very, very different to what most people are accustomed to from Crass. It doesn't even incorporate the normal um, sort of social comment. Um, I mean, I would... Um, as a broad criticism, you know, or as a question, say, well, do you really think that the average person who who would listen to Crass records are, are, are going to be able to understand that sort of imagery? I've got no idea. I'm not concerned with whether they understand it or not. Um, I'm more concerned with um, the illustrations which go with writing and with with music. Um, I've tried my best to do something as beautiful as both the words and the music and to hopefully create a very <coughs> um, inspiring piece. I mean, I have no idea whatsoever whether people understand it. It's the best I can do and that's... Um, but I mean, I, <coughs> I was picking up Phil's idea of you know the sort of imagery and vision that might exist beyond, um, you know, beyond the immediate political problems. I mean, do you feel that the imagery that you um, work with in Acts of Love it has has achieved that end? I mean, do you feel that you're offering some sort of glimpse of what exists beyond the normal barriers of sort of political dogma? Um. Again, I mean, if it gives them a glimpse of anything, I hope it gives people a glimpse of themselves. Um, especially, uh, you know, with acts of love, it's our quiet sides, you know, it's our poetic side, it's our beautiful side, and um, which um, everybody has within them. Some, of, you know, it's deeper in others than, than you know, and I just... I can't really give you a d defined sort of uh, idea about how it politically um, is going to activate anybody. I have no idea what. No, I mean that, that wouldn't be a question. I mean, what, the, the point you you make the point that um, you know these paintings or drawings that you did are. Um, something which is of the quiet and beautiful side. Well, I mean, for the last seven years, Crass certainly haven't um, appeared to show very mm. much of that quiet or beautiful side. I mean, what, do you think it was there in their earlier work? Or well, yes, of course. I mean, if you're going to rant and rave or be angry about anything, one does it because you have a, a vision of the opposite. Um, I've, I've, we've worked the way we have done for the last seven or eight years because... It would. It seemed that people weren't informed about what what was happening in the world, you know, on a simple basis. Especially a lot of young people. They, um, the feeling I got from a lot of young people was that they felt there was something drastically wrong with the world. Um, technically, they didn't know how that was operating, and obviously, we've offered information, which hopefully gave them the possibility of, of um, deciding for themselves what to do, how to do, and uh, a broader uh, outlook on their own lives. I think um, we got to the point where there were, we couldn't say it any clearer, you know, about the bomb, about ecology, about you know, the rights of human beings, I mean, the whole <coughs> gamut of subjects that we've tried to cover. Um, and I think at that point, unless people made their own investigations beyond that, we couldn't offer any more.
but it seemed to be going in the direction of causes. People, young people were getting totally caught up in causes and the whole sort of barbaric nature of the cause that they were trying to confront. And I think what we've tried to do is, is uh, remind people of why they were putting themselves in a very dangerous position socially and uh, personally by making a beautiful record, really. Uh, is he uh, Yves Libertine, the chanteuse, chanteuse de la disque Act of Love? And uh, Eve, um, uh, G's been talking about mm. having tried to make a beautiful record in Acts of Love. Have you, what were your reasons for wanting to sing in that way? I mean, was it purely a technical thing or have you always wanted to sing in that way? Do you, did you enjoy singing in that way? If you're, I mean, we're more used to hearing you shouting and screaming. Yes, I enjoyed singing in that way. I'd never sung in that way before and it was quite an experience and I learned a lot doing it. I don't really know what's gone on in the, what you've been talking about really as to the reasons for doing it. Well, well I mean, more what your reasons. Do you, do you feel that by offering something of beauty, which is quite... Well, I feel that with the stuff we've done before, it may not have seemed to have been offering something of beauty, but it, we were sort of like shouting about what was preventing that beauty. And the beauty was there as something intangible at the end of all the shouting in a way, and I think possibly got obliterated a, a bit at times, although I think people did seem to understand what we, what we were getting at. And I think it's just the obvious it seemed like an obvious time to make a record like that, really. W would you say <coughs> that the record, I mean, given that Frass is sort of renowned as being a punk band, I mean, would, you, would you say that Acts of Love qualifies as being a punk record? Well, I, what do you mean by punk? Well, I mean, given the spirit of punk, I mean, do you feel that um, punk is a musical style or is it an um, attitude of mind? Do you think that the um, ideas <laughs> and expressions in Acts of Love are, um, you know, could be described as being punk, or is it, you know, classical? Record? Well, if I mean, if punk is sort of turning about and throwing something out from a different angle, I mean, which something new or as new as new as it is to to you at the time when you're doing it, I mean, I think then it still is in the spirit of so-called punk. Yes. I mean, one of the original messages of, of punk was you know, to get up and do things yourself. And it's, it, it does appear now that an awful lot of what is, what is called punk um, is a, has become a style where, where people will pick up a guitar and they'll play well, three chords. Well, it's a fashion, yeah. And, and it's a facility as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, people now play punk music, whereas the original punk music, you know, as played by people like Christ, you know, we, we invented. Uh, and that's become a style. So. I mean, I would say that it was actually more consistent with the whole sort of ethic of punk. Acts of Love is more consistent with the eth ethic of punk, in other words, of doing it yourself, than an awful lot of what... Well, thank you for answering your question, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> I have all the answers. <laughs> right. Um, at this point, uh, Nemo um, happens to be here, who's a student a question at uh, here, Summerhill which School. Says, how can you the, uh, explain why your name and action are more institutions, <laughs> <music you laughs> institutions in this country? And uh, perhaps he can tell us. Don't let you might I well. think originally I mean, when we chose the sort of benefits no, of a crass, free school, we had hoped that it would free school could possibly go beyond just society. eight people in a band, <laughs> and it would actually be a word of <laughs> well so much for A.S. Neal's uh, teaching <laughs> inspiration uh, radical thought if you like but it wouldn't just be a band of eight people you know with music with crass if you saw the crass sign it would symbolize 
a whole new world. Now you say, you say that the crash um, sign um, um, you hope would symbolise a whole new world. Yeah, well, how, how would you explain, explain to many people the, the fact that to many people the crash symbol, uh, which is sprayed on walls and worn on people's jackets, to many many people, probably to far more people than it represents peace and love. It represents violence and antisocial behaviour. How would you? How would you? Well, actually, I'm a bit confused about. That. I thought you meant the word crass. Um, the symbol is something different altogether. Um, um, I think, obviously, because we've tried to confront society that we live in and the sort of moral and immoral structure that we're brought up in, um, we're a thorn in the side of, of authority, and obviously. Um, They've used, uh, because of the fact that we're an irritant, I mean, they've used that to label us as very aggressive, violent, hate people. And obviously uh, people are very shallow in their understanding of how media is used and have picked up on that. And it's doggedly sort of traipsed ahead of us whenever we try to set up gigs or anything they get cancelled even before we get there because uh, they hear it's crass well, that must be violence which is uh, you know very sad but the people don't think beyond you know the first statement they read if they were to look a bit further they would understand that it uh, it's totally the opposite now obviously we get um, mild forms of trouble at gigs but it certainly isn't violence as such, I mean, yeah, but certainly I mean, compared with society's violence. But if one reads many of uh, uh, Crass's lyrics, you know, they seem to be sort of rich in violent imagery and violent language uh, and abusive attacks on you know, all, all quarters of society. How, how do you console that to you know, your concept of a peaceful world? Well, I would first of all say violence is the wrong word. I mean, we've never done anything violent, not even in the words. We've done things that are very angry and very confronting, um, but they've always always been done from a, from a stance of passion, um, you know, and from a genuine uh, honesty. Um, there isn't one thing I would consider that we've done which has been violent. I think it's the wrong word to use. And if people can't see beyond that, um, if people just read one line and isolate one line and see that as violent, well, um, there's little one can do about that on you know, the mass of society, but just keep going because uh, it's only time that will, uh, you know, hopefully get anything through. Eve, uh, G was, uh, G was talking, talking about, about the difference, difference between, between violence, violence and, passion. and passion, claiming um, that crass um, um, have acted with passion. Um, what place do you see passion as having in, you know, in an everyday role? I mean, is is there a, is 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 passion something to do with desire? Is desire passion? Uh, when does passion become violent? It's a very sort of complex thing to talk about, really, isn't it? You not want to talk about it? Is that well, right? yes. I mean, I, I would. Well, you know, I'm happy to talk about mm. it, but I have to sort of think about it a bit. Or should I turn off the thing and think about it a bit? Maybe. You know, I have my own personal. Um, my own personal feelings on what passion is but I mean there's passion yeah but cra crass for the last seven years have been telling people to um, stand on their own to the, I mean uh, yes sir I will mm. ends with the words there is no authority but yourself so ultimately surely your personal feelings on what passion are uh, is 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 of ultimate value to what crass would claim um, they're talking about. I mean, it does seem to me that to to some extent, you know, Crass has been able to present themselves as a body over the last seven years, that the individuals within that haven't come forward 
um, as a dimension you know, as, in, as individuals yet you know, which seems slightly contradictory because um, for a band that has said well you know the individual is all important and the individual awareness is all important you know then your feelings on something like passion surely must be if crass is of any importance you know then your feelings are of crass in that in that sense well, I think maybe I've changed a bit over the last. Maybe since doing acts of love, I don't know. I, I think passion can be very misguided on occasions. I think people can catch hold of a passion um, within groups of people. I mean, I've seen, I've even felt it myself while singing on the stage on occasion, that something I mean, the words always meant, I always meant and felt the words that I was singing, but maybe my delivery of them would be more passionate if I was feeling angry about something. I mean, it's all so, so complex, and you can sort of pull people into passion, and it, I don't think it's always the right, the right emotion. I mean, a true passion, passion for... I suppose the things that the songs in Acts of Love were about, I mean, I I can understand that, but I, I just feel that sometimes it can be very misguided, and I, I don't know, it's, it's very complex, really. I don't I was thinking more, if you're going to use the word passion and keep it within the realms of the band, um, it's one agreed to participate in the band and to agree to have an agreement on what the band and the people within it were trying to say and do. And, I mean, that passion is one's own honesty to the things we've tried to deal with. I mean, there is personal passion for um, the obviously overlap into the band and and you know, passion beyond the band, but within it, I mean, I use the word passion really to describe where a lot of the questioning and inquiry was coming from, and a lot of that anger was coming from. Um, I, I just feel that sometimes passion can be used very wrongly. I think, and I've seen it happen and it's happening all, all the time um, people can use as an excuse their passion against causes you know certain things which are wrong in society whereas in fact they're in a way hiding away from something which is within themselves would you would you say that this maybe was the case uh, with, with crass in its previous incarnations and do you feel you know, drawing from what you and G have just said, um, uh, do you think that some of the passion that Crass Express was misguided, and maybe Acts of Love is a more honest or no? I don't. I don't think it was misguided. I think it was. It was always done very honestly, right from the beginning. I think. I feel that possibly towards the end, like at the end of what we were doing in that area, or, or the last things that we did before Acts of Love were possibly, I don't know for other people, possibly for myself, were a bit carried away with the, the politics or the, the ideas um, and not, not thinking too much beyond that. I mean, I don't know, that's how I personally feel about it. I think that it's very easy to become a victim of, of your passion and I think that's very dangerous. I think, for me, Acts of Love has been a sort of, was the starting point anyway. I mean, the poems and the original illustrations were done a long time before um, Crass was formed, and they were almost part of the inspiration, part of the source of going on to say what we did. And, I mean, for me, it's a sort of return to those roots, not a 
not going backwards, but the source of that uh, um, inspiration within oneself. Um, and through doing it the way we've done, again, is inspired again to go on to other things. I mean, I, th I think it's a, as far as what we've done for the last few years with Christ, it's a very natural extension. Um, for me, I mean, there was, it was a perfect thing to do next. I, I, I think that in a way it was a, s a sort of cle a cleansing um, and sort of reassessing and, and as G like G says, sort of remember, it was like a remi reminding oneself about, I mean, for me, I, I felt we got very bogged down sometimes in the, in the anger and, and almost could forget, like through the uh, misty haze, what it was, why, why the anger was there on occasions. Um, and I think that now we, you know, to go on, I mean, because those things still do exist and that anger is still there. And I think, you know, hopefully we'll go on, but with a sort of renewed vision, if you like. And wh wh what is the, uh, what is that vision? I mean, what do you feel that vision is? Well, I think it's, um, it's much, it's something which is in, more in it's internal in in everybody for me and i think it's a, a more sort of looking to oneself and then speaking from from there rather than from speaking outside yourself um that's so one way i could describe it uh because uh, i feel that um you know to to in many respects acts of lovers um you know very much a, a personal statement for me uh i'm going to ask uh firstly g to ask me a question about it then i'm going to ask eve to ask me a question about it otherwise i won't have a chance to <laughs> answer any questions which would be most unfair on the uh, listeners um penny when you decided to put acts of love to music did you do you feel that um like in the past Christ has concerned itself with a lot of um public um, uh a public way of going about trying to explain something and there's been very few personal uh experiences or statements you know to do with one's own uh, development do you feel that acts of love could possibly affect more people because it's a personal statement rather than a um, an outside statement do you think it's a possibility of reaching more people and people would feel, feel more affected by it I think ultimately, yes. I mean, in, in my own case, certainly the um, things that have inspired me are not political works in the um, sense that Crass's earlier works were political works. I mean, what has inspired me are the uh, poems and the paintings and the pieces of music that have been left, which are statements of that which is beyond, of the human spirit, of the um, unending quest of the human um, in search of that spirit and the, and, the, and, the, and the achievement of that spirit. I mean, in Monet's Water Lilies or in um, Brahms' symphonies, um, in Walt Whitman's poetry, you know, I see expressions of the human spirit, the unbeaten human spirit that has um, existed throughout history and despite history. Um, one could reasonably say that throughout history um, the powerful, the wealthy, um, the evil and the malicious have conspired to destroy the human spirit. One could quite reasonably say that in modern society everything is designed to destroy the human spirit. Um, I would hope that Acts of Love is a contribution um, to the documentation of the spirit. Um, I would hope also that 
um, beyond and above the seven years that we were crass, the punk band, you know, that, that some um, spirit rose above all that. I mean, I believe that was the case. I believe the reason for our uh, enormous popularity has been quite simply that people do recognize the spiritual value of what uh, we've tried to offer, that, that we're not simply talking about hard, earthly, mortal facts, that we're talking about the potential and the value um, of the human spirit, that that can rise above the mundanity and the horror of everyday life. Do you feel then that, <coughs> um, I mean, every, uh, for centuries upon centuries, um, there has been produced um, very inspiring work in music, as you say, in painting, in writing. I mean, one could um, list a whole range of people that have contributed to that human spirit. Um, do you have some sort of idea that by continuing with this human spirit in the same tradition that it's going to rectify the horrors that continue to go on in this world? Well, everything that uh, is of value in, uh, in the world of human affairs has been created through the endeavor of the and, and, and through the hard work of the human spirit. Um, our whole culture, our whole way of life, for what it's worth, um, exists through the endeavors of the human spirit, for those who seek peace, th for those who seek love, um, for those who seek a future. The warmongers throughout history haven't been able to terminate um, the great desire to live and to live beyond and to, and to seek vision. Um, and the contribution of acts of love is possibly nothing compared to uh, some of the greater contributions, but nonetheless, um, I hope, you know, to throw yet another drop into the ocean. I, I felt that we were involved as, as Crass the Punk Band in a, what uh, increasingly has become a, an isolated, ghettoized group of people, people on the outside. Um, society in itself is becoming harsher with those people. Soci uh, a society in the UK and no doubt in France is closing its doors on those who dissent, on those who object, on those who oppose. Um, it's very easy for the state to look at punk music as we have known it and dismiss it and dismiss us as idiots. Um, yet those very same people will have on their lounge walls a, a painting by Van Gogh uh, for, for which they'll have paid thousands of pounds, for which um, they'll have many, many hours of joyful rhetoric, yet Van Gogh himself was a punk. Um, Beethoven was a punk. Um, Mozart was a punk. Um, Throughout history, these people have contributed and contributed and contributed, and I think that ultimately the only way um, in which we can achieve the ends um, you know, of harmony uh, is through our own individual endeavor and through our statements of you know, our glorious spirit. Yes, but given that this glorious spirit has now, um, and people will continue to create um, brilliant works, of, of all natures, given that um, this spirit will continue to create and given that we have recognized that authorities, those who are supposedly in power, have recognized that fact, um, do you think it's enough then just to continue with the tradition of just creating um, these magnificent shows of the human spirit because, um, as you have just stated, um, authority is ready to back, back them against the wall and shoot the lot, I mean, to finish it. I mean, we're all well, well aware that um, governments have also learnt the power of the human spirit and will do it everything in their utmost to kill it once and for all. 
yeah, so well, that it brings the whole human race into line with their requirements. I, I think that's all, I mean, it's almost irrelevant. I mean, I think the sort of vain and stupid attempts of, um, you know, the warmongers to terminate the spirit are, um, are almost irrelevant compared to the sort of great history of, um, of hope that um, artists and philosophers um, poets and music makers have created throughout time. Um, I mean, I, w I would sort of suggest that you know, Baudelaire's poems are actually more significant in history than um, Hiroshima was. Well, I don't think anyone... Um, I um, think you're right there, but uh, the problem doubts the validity uh, of with that is that... that Baudelaire... Um, but it's time. Hiroshima that will get the playtime. It will be Hiroshima that's brought uh, into being every year. It will be a Hiroshima that's pushed as the creative um, side of it all. Uh, yeah, but that's the double bind. I mean, the double bind is that, I mean, this week, for example, in the UK, every evening there's films and discussions about the effects of Hiroshima, about the effects of a nuclear attack on on the UK and I mean basically all this does is to further intimidate people it doesn't actually broaden their spirit it doesn't give their spirit horizon it, it, it limits the spirit because um, when people suffer fear um, their, their fear is, is really spiritual bondage um, and really the I mean I would I would um, in retrospect say that possibly crass as a band made some of those mistakes itself, you know, in, in, in um, creating a sense of fear unwittingly and unintentionally, but I think some, there are occasions in our past work where um, we created fear, and that's a negative um, feeling, it's a negative force. I mean, it's very important that people should be aware. Um, it's very important that people should be informed. Uh, people should know what happened in Hiroshima, they should know what happened in the Nazi concentration camps. But they should, if they live in fear of that, um, then then they then they live limited lives, um, and we have to find that balance. Now, all too often, what appears to be informed opinion, what appears to be uh, offering information, is in fact being used simply to intimidate. It is enormously to the advantage of the state. Um, for CND to exist, for example. Uh, CND promotes fear. Uh, because it isn't an organization that's attempting to look at vision, to, uh, attempting to look at something beyond, attempting to offer some real tangible future, because it's basically a negative force which is simply saying, we're afraid of being bombed, we're afraid of American presence in this country, etc., 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 in fact, it's having the reverse effect uh, to the one which it, it would claim it wants. Um, so inadvertently and unintentionally, it's serving the interests of the state. Well, yes, but that obviously is bound to happen. Um, it's happened on a grand scale, you see, and because it's on a grand scale, it's uh, the fear that we may have instilled in people has happened on a smaller scale. Um, unintentionally and I think we've recognized it well enough to counteract that in some way but it will instill fear in people because simply because of the subject matter no matter how you approach it if you're going to give information detailed information about things but, uh, but as long as fear exists then then the um, then the threat exists as long as the threat exists um, the fear exists. I mean, it's a vicious circle. Until we can climb out of our fear, until we are no longer intimidated by the warmongers, until we're no longer intimidated by the existence of the bomb, until we realize that the bomb is an utter irrelevance um, in the grand scale of our lives, in the grand scale of the world, in the grand scale of all futures that ever existed, then we can't rise above that. We have to lift ourselves out of that fear. Um, and rise above it because that's the only place that we can exist free of um, those fears and, 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 and the many fears that exist beneath that. I agree, but how do, uh, how do you give <coughs> someone like Baudelaire a grand scale uh, expose? 
Um, because our whole culture is based precisely on the writings of people like Baudelaire. If it if may be so, but I would say the average person has never even heard of The him. average person hasn't he heard of Oscar Wilde in this country. Oscar Wilde um, is probably one of the major creators of what is called modern-day English culture or British culture. Um, the attitudes and views and manner of existence, etc., etc., that he expressed uh, emanated into every corner of British life, just as Sartre's ideas um, are in every nook and cranny of, of the French landscape. Inadvertently, I mean, no doubt thousands of people in France haven't heard of Sartre in, in anything but name, certainly hadn't read his books, yet his philosophies are expressed and found in every single walk of life in, 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 in France. Well, of course they are, and so are, you know, the insidious side of uh, society's morals. You know, they, they spring from equally as powerful sources and, s and spread into people's lives that they don't even, haven't even heard of. Um, you know, again, one is talking about balance, and, you know, and it's as things go on, as the influence of Oscar Wilde, as the influence of the bomb, as the influence of Shakespeare go on from one century to another, they do alter in their form. And because of the power, especially in the media um, and in the schools and in the family of the system that you live within, it has... Um, an incredible effect on changing some of the most radical thought um, that's been expressed through the ages. I mean, take you know, take Shakespeare if you like. I should imagine in his time he was an incredibly radical thinker, um, and yet, you know, through the centuries that we've passed, it's come down to a sort of entertainment level almost. Um, unless you can reintroduce people back to that radical thinking and to search for themselves and find out, then Baudelaire will become exactly the same. You know, one has got to try in some way to balance it on the same grand scale, and that's very, very difficult. You know, we're talking about... Yeah, we're, we're not in opposition. I mean, I don't No, feel we're not in opposition. I, I feel that when um, creativity is in opposition to destruction, then inevitably destruction prevails. Um, and again, I would, I would say that to a very small degree, um, that was one of the things that we initially didn't realize, you know, as, as cra Crass the punk band. I don't think we initially realized that um, creativity in opposition to destruction um, cannot prevail. Um, creativity has to be itself, be, um, be motivated by itself, not, um, not in opposition. Uh, it must be informed, it must be aware, but it mustn't, it, it, the moment it, it, it falls into the trap of being in opposition, then it's becoming defined. The whole purpose of creativity is, 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 is that it is channeling and describing undefined areas. It's bringing form in, uh, into the form, uh, fr from formlessness, it, it's creating form. Um, the moment the form is defined by the state or by the authorities, by the schools, by parents, by the church, you know, then, then we're no longer in a creative situation. And what we have to do is we have to be aware of um, the political and social conditions and we have to sidestep them um, to allow our creativity to be free, because if our creativity isn't free, then we're not actually offering anything real and positive. We're not offering vision. We're simply offering opposition. Well, I think also once it gets defined and uh, falls into all the areas that you described, it becomes self-important, and there's no creativity and self-importance whatsoever. Right, right Penny. I just want to well, ask well, you um, who well, that person is um, in Acts of Love who uh, keeps uh, following you around everywhere. <laughs> Would you tell that us? Third, <laughs> that second well, as, uh, as uh, <laughs> I, think, I think somewhere, oh yeah, it does, on the uh, <laughs> cover it says that they're songs to my other yeah, self. Um, and that's <laughs> the answer. I mean, uh, 
many of the poems, um, when I wrote them, I actually wrote them to people. Um, I used I used actual um, individuals as models for that other self, you know, so that so that the poems themselves had this sense of um, of an existence, of a form. Um, but when I when when I wrote them to other people, I was effectively writing them to myself. I uh, by um, trying to describe my own spiritual values or my own sense of being um, as, as opposed to my mortal existence, if that's the right word. Um, I had to create an external form um, to describe um, as my other self. The other self I am talking about in uh, Acts of Love is my mortal self. Um, I believe the poems themselves came from my spiritual self. And do you feel that those two are um, s very separate, or do they sort of do they come together, you know, in the in the work that you do? You know, at the work that m you know maybe the things that you've done with Crash. Well, at, r at risk of appearing pretentious, I mean, I don't. Um, I feel they do come together in the sense that I. Uh, my physical form and the conditioned intellect within it um, choose to do whatever they choose to do, be it being in crass or um, doing the music for acts of love or whatever. Um, yet I believe that I don't have the capacity uh, to achieve the things that I appear to achieve. In other words, I do believe that to some extent uh, as is the case, I believe, with all creative people, that I channel. Um, I surprise myself constantly at the things I do. I don't set out to um, achieve what I might or might not achieve. I simply put myself in the situation whereby something might happen and something always appears to happen. I can't rationalize that, so... I can only assume, and in answer to your question, therefore, that the two selves do come together, um, that I put my physical or mortal self in a situation, and my spiritual self supplies the information, supplies the guidance, and supplies the tunes, if you like. In writing Acts of Love and putting it out as a record, um, do you perhaps uh, hope that for people who've never even thought of that as a concept, um, they may become aware of something within themselves that that they were hitherto, you know, it was unknown to them. And do you think that 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 could be of help to people at all? I'm convinced it could. I mean, that my that my own life has, um, for the last twenty five years has been guided purely by my faith. It isn't a Christian faith, it isn't even a religion, um, but it's an utter and complete faith in the knowledge that something, um, and I don't mean an entity, I don't mean any form, but something of far greater importance than I, Penny Rambo, exists um, beyond all of us, uh, and certainly beyond me. Um, I don't feel and never have felt intimidated or frightened of the bomb, for example. I don't feel frightened of authority, for example. Um, I don't fear these things because I know these things are of no importance. They are of no consequence in um, the real scale of things. I, as a mortal form, you know, may find myself in this situation or that situation. All those situations are arbitrary. Um, they, are, they, are, they are of ultimate unimportance to me. Um, if I can pass on some of that faith, and I don't mean it in, a, in any religious sense, but the complete faith that something exists of far greater consequence, of far greater importance than the foolish and silly mortal form that we've been given, the name that we've been given, the identity we've been given, the condition we've been given, an awful lot of what 
um, Christ the band talked about was the fact that we've been conditioned into being what our parents want us to be, what the church wants us to be, what our schools want us to be, what, our, what the factories or places of employment want us to be. Well, we are none of these things. We're not even what we want us to be um, in the truest sense until we realize that we're nothing, that, we're that, that, that there's no foundation, until we realize that in the sort of purest sense. You know, we can't really choose how we want to be because we're a victim of those conditions until we cease to be victims of those conditions and, and until we realize that the only choice we have is our own and having realized that we are nothing, we then make that choice, you know, then we can't move forward. And that all sounds a bit sort of complex. And is, is this, uh, you were talking earlier about sort of real, like, true creativity, is, is this other self where you, is that where you would say that true creativity comes from? Yes, undoubtedly. And so, I mean, that's, uh, that's the most important issue to you in a way then, is it? Of, of, cha of change, if, if there's hope for change. Yes, ultimately, I don't believe there can be any change. Um, any real ch I don't. I, I, I think ultimately no real change can come about until each individual has become, um, for want of a better word, self-aware. There are political situations which might well be t intolerable, in which case I would totally support opposition to those political situations. Um, I mean, although Crass are in noun as being a pacifist band, for example, I mean, I would openly claim to support, for example, in, uh, Nicaraguan um, forces, as I would tentative, tentatively, tentatively support the IRA. I believe that their cause um, is justified. I'm not entirely um, convinced by their methods, but nonetheless I totally and utterly sympathize with the cause. Um, so therefore, I'm not blind enough to think that, you know, by adopting spiritual cliches one's going to rise above the problems of the world. I think ultimately, unless we're able to rise above the problems of the world, the problems of the world will always exist. But I do recognize that that's the ultimate, and, and the immediate problems uh, must be confronted if need be. Would, um, I don't, I mean, would you say, I mean, when you talk about supporting Nicaragua and you know, tentatively the IRA in Ireland, um, would that be with the other self that you talk about? Or would that, I mean, I, I don't quite Certainly, understand. Certainly, yeah. 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 I don't believe that my, um, you know, what I truly am is in the least bit concerned with, interested in, or involved in, you know, the political uh, struggles of, of human beings, you know, uh, uh, of conditioned beings. Um, it exists beyond, beyond, beyond those considerations. If one was to choose to be the other self continually, um, would the issues that one has spoken about, the troubles of this world, would they exist? Ultimately not. I mean, I'm sure there are um, people sitting on high mountains in the East who are unaware of the existence of these problems and wouldn't recognize them as problems in any case. Um, I mean, I personally um, don't support, I mean, it's not a matter of supporting, but I don't, I don't adhere or follow that form of action. I believe that um, if we are fortunate enough to see the light, if that's, if that's the right expression to give it, you know, then, it, then it's our moral duty um, to return bearing that light and to try and spread that light. Um, Crass, my involvement in Crass was certainly um, no more and no less than that. Um, the fact that it's been described as anarchy or 
you know, any of the other isms or punk or whatever is, is utterly irrelevant to me. I mean, my involvement, as I believe the involvement of most of the people, if not all the people in Crass, was precisely this. You know, we felt um, to our own individual degrees um, that we had seen some form of light and we brought it back into everyday form. Um, I think we've given out just about all the information um, that, that, that's readily needed um, on the human predicament. Um, and we're now um, confronted with being able to offer what we um, A, see as the source of our own inspiration, and, and B, as being the only possibility for um, the future of our world. Some people are worrying about Crass, the band, and suppose the band has split up because of <laughs> musical differences. Gee. Yes. Some people are worrying about Crass, the band, Silly and suppose buckets. the band has split up because of musical differences. Gee. Yes. Some people are worrying about the Crass, the band, and suppose Silly the buckets. band has split up because of musical differences. Gee. Yes. Basically... If some people are worrying about Crash the Band and suppose the band has split up because of musical differences, just silly we can only say <laughs> it's a shame they haven't got something better to worry about. <laughs> bon, uh, ici, uh, question numéro uh, quatre, je pense. Um, uh, ici, Yves Libertine. Uh, Eve. Uh, some people are worrying about <laughs> Crash the Band and suppose the band is split up because of musical differences. I don't know, possibly. <laughs> Gee, how can you explain why your name and action are more famous than the music you play? I think I've answered this one before. <laughs> Only a few people in France have listened to your stuff. What stuff? <laughs> oh, music. Oh, music. Um, why? <laughs> <laughs> few, uh, only a few people in France have listened to your stuff. Only a few people in France have listened <laughs> to your In France, your records are not distributed. Can you tell why? <laughs> <laughs> only a few people in France have listened to your stuff. <laughs> Eve, only a few people in France have listened to your stuff. Well, it's... <laughs> Not <laughs> bloody surprises, <laughs> <and> fucking awful. <laughs> Listen to Susie and the Banshees any day. <laughs> did, did you write those fucking awful songs? <laughs> it's, rather, it's, rather, it's rather interesting that Penis Envy, um, recently in a, a court case, Crass was taken to court for obs obscenity. Um... And in the appeal case that they ultimately won, having had to spend something in the region of £6,000 to put up an adequate defence, um, only one song was found to be obscene, which was Barter Motel, mm -hmm. which I believe you wrote. Yes, I was rather proud of that. <laughs> After everyone's efforts to be obscene. <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, what else? Well, I don't know. You <laughs> Who's come up here to um, answer a question that um, we thought might be relevant? As uh, the individual in Crass, who certainly at gigs is notably and noticeably most involved in um, preparation of food, um, and certainly... Um, you're frequently found making bread, grinding wheat. Um, do do you, as a as a personal philosophy, do you feel that that bread? The Chinese have a proverb that says that um, the person who doesn't make their own bread is a fool and an imbecile. That, that and and one hears the expression that bread is the staff of life. Um, do you feel that? that in bread making perhaps um, there's a revolutionary way forward that you know perhaps crass in its uh, incarnation as a punk rock band failed to represent
Can I just say we must be old men in that <laughs> case? <laughs> <laughs> because we never get the chance to make our own bread because Joy always makes it. <laughs> the reason I make so much bread is is to make the other people appear to be fools. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't think there's anything about my enjoyment of preparing food and making bread that uh, has anything more in it than what we were tempted to do with the band. And it just seems to be naturally a part of of um, living well and having contact with every every part of your life. How you eat, I think, is very important. And given that a um, army uh, goes to war on its stomach, <laughs> so we're told. <laughs> <laughs> Crawling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crawls to war on its stomach. Um, do you feel that uh, Crass has uh, gone to war on on its stomach, and do you feel pleased that you've so often filled its stomach? Yes. I mean, the one and only time we went on tour when I actually managed to make food at gigs was uh, noticeably better for everybody because it meant that we all ate, you know, at least one decent bowl of food a day rather than just sort of subsisting on crap. Chips. <laughs> do you, uh, do you, do you, uh, do you feel that? Um, um, I mean, I'm asking these questions partly because so often people feel that um, um, that sort of work, um, you know, isn't as relevant as. Uh, I mean, I, obviously, you write songs, you sing in the band, um, you write books, and you contribute in you know, many, many other ways, but. Um, I mean, for example, you made the bread handout. Uh, there used to be a recipe. Oh, um, actually, that was Steve's one. Oh, was it the vegetarian one? Sorry, the vegetarian. It was a bit of a more realistic one. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, do you uh, do you feel that that there is a equally creative role? I mean, one hears so many, so often, feminists decrying the kitchen, saying, you know, it isn't a woman's place. Women shouldn't be in the kitchen. Um, I mean, would you dispute that, or...? i only on the level that, um, when an idea becomes a dogma, then it's, uh, it loses all its value. And I think it's up to the individual to decide where they want to be and how they want, where they want to sort of be creative. And I think cooking and bread making is very creative for me anyway, when I've I've learned over the years more and more about the food I make. You know, it's become more simple now. It used to be quite sort of heavy. Um, maybe that's just part of the way things have changed between us anyway. But um, I find all those things about, you know, <coughs> women not, you know, shouldn't uh, be in the kitchen, all that sort of thing. I, I mean, maybe it needs to be said at first in order to try and sort of analyse why they have been in there and, and what their lives have been like before, but you know, I mean, I don't think it should be suddenly become something that's uh, a taboo. There is one other question. Actually, um, I'd like to say something else about about the food yeah. thing. I, mean, I know I, I don't feel it's my role. There is one further question. You know, those questions um, might have made me sound as um, if I I've adopted that particular thing as my. Asking whether there's any bread and tea. I don't actually feel <laughs> um, that I'm no, bound to it or held by it. It's not something I do because of, of not being able to do other things. It's just something mm. I happen to be sort of vitally interested in and feel is, you know, it's important. Yeah, as I, the as more as I can as learn I from it, you know, I can learn as much from that as I can by doing other things, which I do anyway. Yeah, as I do gardening. Or yeah, so whatever. Whatever, yeah. Right. Um, the other question, I think. Um, we might be able to answer is that uh, some people are worrying about Crash the band and suppose the band has split up because of musical differences. Do they really? <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I think it's really been partly to do with me because I've been uh, really interested in making instruments out of bread. Uh, Phil, <laughs> as, as, you, um, <laughs> as one of your 
uh, one of the major roles in Crass's dealing with uh, distribution. Um, can you explain why Crass's records are so incredibly difficult to get in France and perhaps virtually impossible? Well, I think hell, isn't I the very definition in creation. creation. How, how did you solve this? Therefore, he <laughs> is. It seems to be very difficult to find people who will distribute our stuff in France. Uh, we have now a fairly large network of people who are doing mail order, but due to the sort of general decline of Brit-style punk and the fact that it never really took off in France, which is probably not a bad thing, uh, there isn't a massive network of people ready to work with it. When, when you say it's not a bad thing that uh, Brit-punk didn't take off in France particularly, I mean, uh, I think it is the case that American thrash um, was quite popular in France. I mean, why do you feel it's unfortunate? Well, I mean, or fortunate that British punk didn't take off to such an extent. Because mostly because uh, punk was was a product of the English situation in the mid seventies, and it was a response to that situation. The a lot of countries or a lot of people in in sort of various countries around the world picked up on the fashion or the loud music or the fast music or whatever or the bright colours uh, but I don't think the actual ideas behind this and the feelings behind punk and the, were necessarily understood in other parts of the world and other countries which have other cultures. Why, why, why then um did American thrash, or does American thrash seem to have the popularity? I think because know? America almost automatically takes a position of uh, trying to lead people. So even those people who are working in an alternative field will think, feel it's their right and almost their duty to spread their ideas and to, if you like, push their ideas onto the rest of the world. It's a basic imperialist situation. England did it in the 19th century, America's doing it in the 20th. But how, but how then um, can you justify Southern Studios' role in this uh, promotion of America? I can't. Um, in, 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 was um, about, um, in, in Great American Britain, cultural domination, you uh, lived and worked in America. Uh, um, uh, um, and obviously, you've uh, seen the uh, uh, same thing happen as Phil was describing, whereas Punk initially was something which had an indigenous quality, and all of these things are actually labels of peace that was taken from anarchy sort of immediate cultural um, roots and certainly now so what is the magazines value like Maximum Rock and Roll would give the impression how can art that art and punk has become a style um, back certainly dominated by, by sort of West Coast thrash music personal and do you see this as being sort of typical of an American how, however good natured or well intentioned American um, bands might be do you, do you how see do you this see as consistent with sort of American of imperialist redefinition do you think it's possible and Margaret, uh, Mary Daly Margaret Daly no not really I mean Mary uh, Daly uses like we were saying earlier you take inspiration from all sorts of things they can come from any corner of the world and you interpret it, interpret them in, in the way that you feel you can understand them. Um, as far as New York was concerned, I mean, punk came from New York, from the New York Dolls. I mean, it wasn't British or English at all. Um, and I would suspect that most punks in New York would still claim it came from the New York Dolls. I mean, I think it's a superfluous argument. Anyway, who cares a fuck where it comes from? Um, well, I, I think I think, for example, in New York at the moment, there are skinheads, many of whom do wear Union Jacks, for example, who um, act in much the same way as skinheads and, and model themselves in uh, in many ways on the skinheads uh, of Britain. Um, I think, um, as far as skinheads in America are concerned, uh, they've taken the surface value, uh, which is visual of uh, the skinheads in this country, but I would say they're much more in earnest as far as uh, fascist thinking is concerned. 
Um, and I would consider them a lot more dangerous because of that. Yeah, the point I was making was that the uh, sort of um, the import, the import of uh, sort of cultural movements, uh, the import of uh, American punk to Italy, for example, doesn't doesn't this actually, in some respects, destroy um, the creative culture um, of Italy or of France or wherever you know that 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 import uh, takes place? Well, I think anything that's um, imported into a country without really trying to understand it or um, that country using it merely as a vehicle for their own expression um, I think is worthless. I mean, uh, obviously, American punk, thrash, hard thrash stuff has gone into countries like Germany and Italy um, and France, you know, in a very undiluted unquestioned form. Um, people like the speed of it and that's what uh, the replica is. Um, I doubt very much if it goes much deeper. Um, I haven't really heard any uh, thrash, American type thrash music from other countries that has used that form and really pushed it into a personalised um, new New media or new way of saying it. Well, is it not so then that you know that that you know, maybe um, you know that that form of um, cultural import isn't really very diff different, for example, to McDonald's? Does it have any? Uh, does it does it offer more or, or does it? No, do I don't think it ever offers any more or any less. Um, <laughs> it's just um, a commodity. Um, Just another cheap product for the consumer's head. If you like, yes. <laughs> Penny, um, throughout Crass's existence, there's been hundreds and hundreds of interviews. Do you think they have any value at all? Yes, I do, in the sense that... Uh, you know, it's one of the few times that most of the band get a chance to sit together and talk about things. I mean, Steve, you've um, stood on stage on and off for seven years, um, singing about anarchy, freedom, peace, and love. You know, are there other things that you might have sung about? Are there things that you feel you haven't sung about? Are there things you're going to sing about? Um, are there other methods of doing? Um, what you tried to do then? Oh, I don't, I, I don't know. Things are, at the moment, I think, things are going in different directions. I, what's going to come out of it, I, I don't know. Um, as for looking back and thinking I could have sung, I mean, that's quite a lot to be thinking about, really, isn't it? Anarchy, peace, freedom and love. I mean, it's um, four pretty wide basic subjects. Um, I can't say I, I look back and wish I'd been singing about other things. No, I, I was singing about what I was singing about at the time because that was relevant at the time and, and it, it still is relevant. Why aren't you singing now then? Well, I am. I mean, we are, we are still mm. doing stuff mm. and we will be doing the stuff. Mm. I mean, an act, act was a part of that, which was the last thing. We're working on something mm. at the moment. Um, how that's going to turn out in the end, I don't know yet. I mean, we're sort of working on it and it's developing as we go along rather than having a developed idea to start with, which is interesting. Could you, could you expand upon that a bit? Um, because cra well, the method Crass used to work was just to go into a rehearsal room and... Yeah, and had, had ready what we were going to do. Well, this time it's much more organic. <laughs> um, it's, we started with the words and the vocals which we, we've already recorded and then the sounds are being put on top of that um, which is a completely different way around to the way we've worked before. Um, and as I say I don't know what the end result is going to be yet and that's quite exciting. It's an interesting way to work. I mean, what, what more? Gee, you're uh, 
your artwork, which has been sort of consistently of a um, standard that shouldn't have been uh, ignored to the extent it has been by the critics. I mean, it, it's it's obvious that um, Crass as a band could be dismissed as being a bunch of unmusical hooligans who have got no talent at all, but your artwork has been consistently of a um, standard that can't be dismissed on that sort of level. Do you feel that um, perhaps um, your skills uh, as an artist could be used more effectively? Do you feel that um, you know, possibly the use of galleries or the more publications um, could expand your potential as um, a creative artist? Um, as far as critics are concerned, I, they don't particularly interest me. I don't need their um, authority for me to create. Um, as far as galleries are concerned, I'm not interested in selling or contributing to that whole uh, corrupt area of uh, people's abilities. Um, uh, equally, I'm not interested in pieces of work hanging up on a wall, purely, just solely. I mean, uh, I think there could be a, a situation where they, some of the pieces that I've done for the covers and what have you could go on the wall, but I am much more prefer them to be mass-produced where, you know, people could sort of wrap their chips up in them, really, and do whatever. Um, as far as uh, future creative stuff's concerned, that really lies in my field solely. I mean, there are there's masses to contribute to a group situation, but there's also quite a bit I'd like to contribute to the group situation, but purely from something that is in my own head rather than having a subject matter for me to work to. I'd like to see what the subject matter is inside me rather than have it created outside of me. Um, that takes time and uh, there hasn't been the opportunity to do that as yet. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the last question you asked me, you said like for the last seven years I've been up and down on the stage singing about anarchy, peace and love and I said it was pretty and freedom and it was pretty basic and quite wide ranging. Well, I mean it's totally wide ranging. I mean to me that, that includes everything really. Um, I mean anarchy in itself for me um, is totally relevant to the way, I mean to, I mean, to a acts of love is to me an, anarchi an anarchistic record. Um, I'm sure to a lot of anarchists, uh, you know, they'd sort of just laugh at the idea. I mean, the, the, really? I the ideas included in all those sort of four or five things, whatever you said, I mean, uh, are so wide, they're as wide ranging and we use them in a very wide sense of the word. You know, you, it makes it sound very simplistic. Yeah, but the reason I'm asking that question <laughs> is that uh, um, people are very aware of the fact that crass aren't gigging at the moment. It, it's over um, a year since they as a band um, released a record. Now, um, a lot of people will assume that's because, you know, those ideas are no longer held. We were very no. active at one time. Yeah. Hopefully we're de that we're developing those ideas and pushing those ideas, which we did go in a lot of the song, in most of the songs, we went into quite great depth, um, not just various subjects, various ideas. Um, and I think now we're pushing even further and that's always a very difficult process. Um, and quite, quite a painful process in a way because you have, to, you have to start questioning ideas that were possibly quite comfortable and that obviously is uncomfortable. And, uh, I, mean, I, I think to extend on that point, uh, there's no greater security than the 
than the ghetto. There's no greater security than the little niche that you carve out for yourselves. In, in seven years, Crass carved out for itself a very comfortable following, a very comfortable way of life. It would have been very easy for us, um, had we not been the people that we are, to simply have continued producing the sort of songs that we know people want to buy. Uh, that's got nothing to do with why we were a band. It's got nothing to do why, uh, with why we are a band. We are a band to promote ideas, to understand ourselves, to understand each other's. We work as a group um, because that's part of our whole process of learning. Uh, we're not interested in being a rock and roll band. If we were, we'd still be doing records like Stations of the Cr Crass. Um, do you think Cress as a band has uh, grown at all disillusioned? No, I, as a group of people, certainly not. Um, it's become very much more aware. Um, and it's silly to talk about it. Uh, individual members of the band have become aware of the fact that we were beginning to become a negative force, that people were simply using us as a form of entertainment, as another way of getting their rocks off, of another night out, another easy option. We're not interested in being a commodity. We never were interested in being a commodity. Our purpose was to question, uh, was to make people think, was to make people stand back from what they thought they were and have to be faced with what they truly are. Um, if our silence uh, is uncomfortable, then that's precisely the value of our silence. And I sincerely hope that when we start making a noise again, it will it will be equally uncomfortable. We're not interested in being a comfortable commodity. We want to go on being a thorn in the side of both ourselves and of others. Um, would you say the whole time that um, from its very inception which was very organic where crass came together but would you say there's been an equal amount of striving to convey information and um, ideas for uh, the public as there has been a striving for one's own um, enlightenment within that. I, th I think that over the sev uh, over the last seven years, that we as a group of people have had uh, hardly had time to consider our own condition. Um, certainly, when we were gigging, um, you know, we were bodily unhealthy. Um, you know, over the seven years that we were very very active, when we were gigging a lot, when we were recording a lot, we became very very tired, both uh, physically and mentally. Um, that isn't the reason we stopped. Uh, the reason we stopped was because we could no longer see um, that we were creating the questions um, that, that we wished to create. Um, but now I think having stopped in that form, you know, we realized that we hadn't spent enough time, we hadn't had enough time to be able to concentrate on our own um, existence. And I think that Certainly the last year we've been able to rebalance, to um, gain our own strength again, um, and to genuinely reconsider uh, what, w what we've been doing. So you would say that the emphasis, um, not intentionally, um, but the emphasis now lies in um, each individual's uh, self-expression and creating a vehicle for that. Yeah, I, th I think that... Um, the emphasis now lays more with uh, finding our own individual potential and pursuing that potential and sharing that potential with the other members of the group and anyone else who wants to share that potential. We never limited ourselves simply to being Crass the Band. We created our own record label so that other bands could share in the energies that we had and share the fortune that we had had uh, financially. Um, so that the whole um, sort of value of ideas could expand. Um, well, that's basically what we're still doing. We're working more as individuals. Each of us are pursuing what we see as our own personal talents, our own um, individual vision, and then bringing them to 
other members of the group as we always have done and uh, and sharing those ideas and then and then expanding those ideas into various forms of so-called product you know be they records books um or or be they the other things that are, people are pursuing like the healing arts um, um the martial arts or whatever Right, as a uh, special exclusive for uh, Radio Free France, uh, we've just got Pete Wright out of bed. He just sneaked off. And um, basically, um, wh whilst Pete was working on the hoax tape you might have heard about when um, you know, he spent a considerable length of time constructing a conversation between Thatcher and Reagan that then caused an international outrage, um, and various people got in touch with us with other bits of information, true and false, which um, were pertinent to that sort of area. Amongst those was a particularly interesting bit of information about um, international resistance groups. Um, I mean, Pete can explain more about that. They were particularly relevant to the situation in France today. Um, I don't know, were, were, were the connections with... Um, groups like uh, the IRA and the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Or what, what was the basic outline? Please? It's very. It was very difficult to know because um, it seems that there is a secret organization within France um, that um, is very difficult to quantify or or to tie down. It, it has a what seems to be a, a, a perfect cover and the people within the organization are, from what I've heard are able to communicate with one another perfectly well whether or not the state knows about their existence or not. It doesn't actually affect their operation. Um, uh, uh, um, just, um, you know, are, the, are these uh, people Connected with, for example, the bombings that we've been hearing about in Europe. There's absolutely no way of um, telling. Um, from what I know, the the organisation was set up on the basis that at some point there would have to be um, violent revolutionary struggle. And it was thought that if that was coming, then it would be a good idea if people were trained in it. Um, and the only place that you can really get that sort of expertise outside of, um, you know, sort of a not sort of <laughs> terrorist, so-called terrorist cells, is from the government itself. So the idea apparently was to use the conscription imposed upon almost all young men in France and to train in weaponry explosives and also steal a certain amount, whatever sort of quantity of uh, explosives and weapons could be spirited away at the government's expense. And you, and you I think, had evidence that um, there had actually been sort of government cover-ups about the sort of loss of munitions. Well, this is going on all the time. That yeah. the, a lot of stuff does go missing. Generally, it's put down to being the work of um, ordinary thieves. Um, but it seems quite possible that uh, equipment is being stockpiled. And also, in, in perhaps a more important way, is that um, people are staying within the army after their conscription so that they ha still have ready access to information, to weaponry, um, in the same way that the, I think it was the uh, Red Brigade in Italy was quite probably infiltrated at a high level by people like the CIA and that the Red Brigade um, troops uh, were getting their instructions from the CIA and that the, the Americans were actually using a terrorist so-called organisation for their own ends, uh, bombing the people that they wanted bombing, creating situations that were beneficial for American power. Um, 
So, 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 what you're saying is that not only are um, sort of young, um, young French um, anarchists and socialists and intellectuals using conscription as a training ground um, for future revolution. Um, you're also saying that you know actually that you are, are you saying that you've got evidence or have been given evidence during the period in which you were working on those tapes that. Um, suggests that some of the sort of higher-ranking officials within the French army are actually involved in this conspiracy. It tends not to be higher-ranking officials. It tends to be um, the sort of middle officer area that people will go through conscription and then maybe sign on for five years, uh, get some sort of commission. And what it gives them is is the ability to order around quite substantial numbers of people to their own ends rather than to the ends of the orders that they're receiving. Um, because um, this seen as being very useful to be able to have a platoon or a squadron of uh, people working at your own command. And by the time that they find out that it's a... Uh, uh, the orders aren't actually coming down from the top. It's, it would be too late. So, what do you suggest? I mean, what 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 was the information that you were given that these that a there are young French men are joy uh, 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 because they're called up to serve in the army. They're using that as training ground for future revolution. That also mid mid range um, officers or what, whatever you call them are also involved in this conspiracy. But who actually? ultimately is behind all this? I mean, are you, what, is it the CIA or...? There's no way of knowing. Because, I mean, the, the, the arrangement is so perfect um, because it can't be subverted since, I mean, it, it, since the, those are the sorts of considerations I were making, was making initially and in trying to find out more from um, the, the information I was getting about you know whether there was a a basic um organization behind it but it's it seems to be almost totally organic in that um the essence of it is training individuals to use the government's forces and to and to and to get the government to pay for their own training um for their own personal requirements. So, so it it would. I mean, I would sort of hypothesise. Is it is it possible that given that France certainly isn't as dominated by American imperialism as, as say this country is? I mean, uh, the UK is totally sewn up by American interests. Uh, uh, France, um, you know, through de Gaulle's um, rejection of America, doesn't have that. Um, doesn't have that, um, isn't gripped in the same manner by America. So I is it possible that the CIA are actually um, using the um, conscription and the French, uh, French military to actually undermine, um, as, we, as we've seen, you know, the bombings in Europe have to some extent at least undermined um, the uh, French socialist government? Um, you know, is it possible that, that you know that this is a method, or have you any information to suggest that you know that, that this was a CIA um, involvement, or or was the information more involved in sort of an extension of the Red Brigades and the Bader Meinhof groups, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, <coughs> the CIA involvement in sort of French military is is um, independent to the extent that they. They obviously um, infiltrate whatever levels of the military that they need to go into. So there does exist within the French military CIA trained operatives or people sympathetic and passing information to the CIA, uh, either knowingly or unknowingly. Um, but the first, the first I heard about um, this this organisation. I say organisation very loosely. It, it was connected with the French Railroad, and I couldn't understand what possible connection there would be between the military and the French Railways. Um, and then digging around a bit, it seems that 
the 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 people are calling themselves um, the society chemin de fer the the society nationale chemin de fer sncf um, and punning on the iron road um, and they have an instant ready-made cover they can um, move information um, between one another by either sending um, you know, printing up railway heading headed note paper and just writing to one another or sending um, timetables which have been altered or or doctored or in or are in code have you, have you actually seen some of these coded timetables well there's 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 no yeah. there's no way of knowing all i mm. have been told is that that it happens and it seems that um that it's virtually impossible to prove one way or the other um but you have positive evidence that this is the case well, we've had um, some contact with people in the society. Right. Um, and sort of cross-checked with our other sources, um, punks and... Uh, the thing is, it's not intellectuals purely that get involved with this. It's... it's. Um, I mean, the French have a, a very sort of independent outlook, um, which has been... Um, used by the government uh, for its own ends, but the French man, I think, tends to be quite independent. Um, so there's people from poor backgrounds. There's very little sort of political involvement. Um, join the society um, because it's very appealing to. Uh, it's a very straightforward and simple thing. There's no there's no moral questions involved at all. You just go for your training. Um, become an enthusiastic recruit. You don't become a reluctant recruit. You become a, an When you say you go for your training, you mean that people accept call-up because they, they already have agreed that um, with the SNCF, you know, that, that, that they effectively are going to use the training for uh, anti-state activities. Yeah, most... Um, most intellectuals and radicals would probably be very difficult um, conscripts in the army, whereas um, people within the society, um, chemin de fer, um, are in, would tend to be enthusiastic, ambitious, um, and do as well as their ability allowed. Um, and they wouldn't need massive backups of propaganda and indoctrination. Mm. Um, they would be left more or less in, on their own, um, would be dealing with information as individuals, right. um, and would have a, a small number of, of contacts under the cover of the French railways, which seems very, uh, very funny. And I think the reason why something like this probably doesn't exist um in in Britain, although there must be people within the British um army who are both um anarchists or socialist motivated radicals or CIA people. There's no conscription in this country and there's quite probably no conscription because it's it's very dangerous and there's no way the society Chemin de Fur can be stopped. Right. Okay, thanks a lot. Sorry, we got you out of bed. It's <coughs> just to, to to expand upon that. Um, there was another point we that occurred to us just recently. Um, Thatcher's government, you know, had, had been considering reintroducing conscription, and in fact, this was another occasion when we heard about the SNCF. I've, I've been asking questions during this, you know, simply so that we could relay the information obviously I know most of what was going on because obviously Pete and myself chatted about this um, when we heard about conscription or the possibility of conscription in this country we actually did receive um, anonymous letters in fact um, 
from people involved in government um, informing us that um, the British government was well aware of the activities of the SNCF. I think um, I mean, maybe Pete could say a little bit more about that as he was dealing with most of it. Well, I mean, for, for people in France who aren't sort of aware of how um, British parliamentary democracy works, um, in areas which are critical to powerful interests in this country or abroad, uh, the decisions are made before they are presented to government. So the government to, to parliament. So the, the the government is in fact doing a public relations exercise with decisions that have already been made. And it was clear to us from the information we received that the government were not going to allow the reintroduction of conscription because um, they realised quite rightly how vulnerable um, the military and any other area is is to people like this SNCF. There is no stopping them, there is no tracking them down. Right. Alors, et maintenant, ça c'est le fini de la interview de Le Crasse. And uh, we sincerely hope that we've covered all the relevant points. Um, if we haven't, we're very sorry. So, au revoir tout le monde.